So, yep, I'm the solutions architect at the, for the Australian Ocean Data Network. We're part of the Integrated Marine Observing System. And I want to talk to you a bit about who we are first. So, the Integrated Marine Observing System is a nationally funded, an Australian nationally funded um, organisation with a lot of collaborators around Australia. Our base, the basic job is to um, con um, manage the measurement of a lot of different marine data and ocean data that's sort of on a national level. Um, so that's why we collaborate with various different universities and organisations like the CSIRO. And then we also have this um, Australian Ocean Data Network, which is what I'm working on. And so we, it's our job to uh, maintain that data, um, uh, but also to find data from other organisations around Australia that's measuring the ocean and put it all together and make it open and accessible to scientists. So our main priority here is that scientists shouldn't have to be going around to a million different uh, websites to find this data. They should be going to a centralised location where there's a pretty, pretty high level of consistency so they know what they're doing when they go and find something else, especially because some of them are doing cross-domain research and that can be a real pain in the neck if you've got two different sites showing things completely differently. So we try to get a bit of structure around those different um, types of data. As far as IMOS is concerned, we're measuring a lot of different things. We've got satellites um, data coming down, we've got moorings and we're, we're sticking sensors on top of the seals and sending them out to the Antarctic, or not sending them out, they go there of their own accord and we get the measurements back. Um, and then that's all discoverable on our online portal the AODN. In addition to uh, all of those different sort of physical styles of measurement, we've also got a lot of different types of data. We've got this um, profile data and point data, time series data, and that makes our job pretty difficult. We've got to make sure that we can uh, represent all of these things in a sort of consistent manner. And traditionally, the way we've done that is via NetCDF files, which is a very common um, old format in various marine data, marine sciences. Some of the, some of, some of our domains do not like it at all. Um, there's a, there's a big mix in marine science, but we've sort of settled on that net CDF format because it can represent all of these different types. And this is what we've been supporting traditionally, traditional data science. And how do you run a traditional data science um, framework, a paradigm? Well, the, the scientist goes and finds their data set. They download the data set to their local machine and then they do their science. So they open up QGIS and they load up the file they've downloaded into, into QGIS. There's big problems with that these days, of course, because you have data sets that are a terabyte big. You have, it's just, you, you have many, many different data sets that the scientist wants to download. What they have to go to each data set, download each one, bring it together by themselves. Um, it doesn't make too much sense. So that's why I think us and many other organisations in our domain are uh, moving to cloud native data. And the idea of this paradigm is you don't make users download the data. Instead, you design data formats, these cloud native or cloud optimized data formats as they're also called, to work over the internet. You put data files on cloud block storage like Amazon S3. And then you write code libraries that can access that data directly on the fly so that scientists can load up Python or R, they can, uh, they can put in their parameters, what, they w which, which, what type of data, that, which part of the data they want, and all that comes down to them over the network is the specific subset of data that they needed. For instance, they might put in a temporal extent that they want so that they only get for one particular year. They don't need to access all of the other data and download it all onto their local system. So that's where we're moving to and I want to show, I'm going to have two use cases that we've seen that are important use cases for this cloud native data. Um, so I'll start with this one which is looking at gridded time series data. So what we have is this satellite sensing um, data. What we're seeing there is uh, sea surface temperature um, across Australia and that's, that's sort of the satellites going over Australia. Da -da 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 measuring measuring each little bit of bit it's 4500 pixels by 1500 pixels so it's quite um high level of uh you know sensing there and we've got a lot of data in that but what scientists often tell us they want to do is they all they want is the data is the temperature at one particular point and then they want to check that how what what's how that temperature's changed over the period of that we've had satellite sensing which is 30 years worth of data the problem in the traditional data model is because these are very large data sets, 
very high resolution and, and you're putting them over 30 years. This is, this is a daily um, data set, so 365 of these every year for 30 years, each one's very big. They can't really download the whole thing themselves um, and put it onto their machine and restore it. We have provided them a solution for that, that we do ourselves, which we get a server, we download all the relevant files and we, we then filter them for what they need and create a new NetCDF file that they can download. Uh, but that's very slow and annoying if for us having to run that server. It takes a long time. It can take up to a day if they want to, if they want to for the, the full 30 years. So it's a bit of a mess. And cloud native formats like ZAR are what have enabled us to get a faster performance there. And to provide scientists the ability to do this without us having to build them an API or a website. With ZAR, they can actually access it directly with Python. So ZAR is a chunked format, so you see this cube that they represent themselves with. That means that you can choose a particular parameter, you put all the data for that particular parameter together, you sort of say, okay, I want a chunk on, say, 100 days worth. So then each of those 100 days worth is in its own little chunk. That means that if you know the, the format, you know what's in the data, then you're going to be able to know which chunk you need to go to, and you only need to go to that chunk. And that is what we have in ZAR because it's self-describing. It has all the metadata that's needed to understand the file itself. It's also compressed, so it's pretty efficient, and it's multi-dimensional. You can have as many dimensions as you want. For instance, that previous um, data set I was looking at, it's got you know latitude, longitude, and it's also got time. So that's three dimensions. You could also, in certain data sets, have altitude, for instance. Um, and in addition to that, you might also, we don't only me measure sea temperature, so in the same ZAR file, we might put uh, wave height and th other things like that. Fair, we, we might have like 10 different parameters that are measured, and they can all go in the same ZAR file. Um, that's a bit complex, converting to, to, to ZAR, so this there's another library that's been created called Kachunk. This is Python only. Uh, but it basically allows you to pretend you've got a ZAR file. If you have a lot of NetCDF files, you can index them, um, and you can then access them from Python as if they were a ZAR file. So this is a very good intermediate step if you if you have a lot of NetCDF files and you're not willing to go down the process of recreating them in ZAR. And I wouldn't suggest, by the way, deleting your NetCDF files. That's a good archive format, and ZAR is a very new um, format that probably shouldn't be played with as your um, main source of data. So Kachunk is a good way to do that. It won't be as efficient because you don't have that efficient chunking for the cloud um, if you're using your traditional NetCDF files. If you were to recreate all of your NetCDF files, make them efficient, uh, make files as if they were chunks, you could make it just as efficient as ZAR, but what's the point when you could just create a ZAR file? Um, and I can show you what performance we actually saw here. So our legacy download solution that was downloading all the NetCDF files just to subset it was taking 31 hours. The Kachunk index, which sadly needed extra memory because that library needs to load all of the stuff into it, the memory took one hour, and then direct access to ZAR was one minute because, because, that, because accessing it via Python, we just needed to access the exact chunks that were needed to create this time series of a single point over that large, um, that large uh, data set. The second uh, use case I want to look at is data mixing. So what scientists are constantly telling us is they want to find a particular parameter at a particular point. They don't care if that's measured by satellites or seals or moorings. They don't care. They just want to find temperature data or some other sort of data. And how do they do that right now? Well, in traditional data models, they'll need to download numerous files from various collections and check each one for that point to find out, you know, was that point measured in that particular data set? And we've got a lot of data sets that they need to be looking into. So a solution we found for that is GeoParquet. Now, GeoParquet is a developing uh, standard. Uh, it's based on a very well-established base format called Parquet, which is heavily used in business spaces. It's the basis of data lakes. So you put all your business data onto the data lake, and then when someone has some need to use that data to mix it together between lots of different um, sources of data, they can do that. It can be a bit complex to make those queries, and but you have the data at your uh, uh, you can use that data, it's there, it's there to be used. Um, so GeoParquet, the idea is to make, that, make the Parquet standard geospatial native, to allow it to have a, a, a column which provides geographic details of your data. Another important thing about GeoParquet is it's columnar. 
So you can have as many columns as you want and you're not gonna make it less efficient for the users because they only have to access the columns that they need. So in that case with temperature data, if we have 100, 1,000 other parameters, all they have to do is look at that temperature column and those other 1,000 columns are not going to affect the performance. Another useful tool for, for allowing this sort of data mixing is stack catalogs. Um, so this is not a data format. You do not store your data in stack. It's an index. It's an index of all of your data, and you can use this to index Parquet files, ZAR files, COG files, and NetCDF files as well, non-cloud non native data as well. Um, it's metadata about the data and allows programmatic discovery of cloud data assets. So instead of making um, scientists go and access a web catalog, we want them to be able to access directly via Python uh, an index that they can use to find out what data assets we have available, which ones do uh, have temperature data on them. Um, some other formats that we've looked at and we've, we've decided against, I just want to go through these. CloudDB is an interesting one. We, we, when we talked to other organizations, the ones who had very sparse data spoke very highly of CloudDB. It seems like the other formats don't really support um, sparse data as well or as efficiently. Um, should be noted that CloudDB is open source, but it's not an open standard. It's a proprietary company that's um, trying to make money off their cloud um, solution, whereas the other formats I'm talking about are all sort of OG, generally OGC supported sort of open standards as well. Um, also, we also found the libraries for CloudDB were a bit annoying. They were sort of built, the library was fundamentally the library was built in C++ and follows C++ paradigms, which is no fun when you're using Python or Java. Um, uh, the most popular cloud optimized format is probably cloud optimized geotips or COGS, uh, which you've heard about in previous um, talks. Uh, this is built on the top of the geotip um, file format, um, which is very common in satellite imagery. Uh, it does have, so it's pretty good for raster data, but there's a lot of um, downsides to it compared to ZAR. ZAR's a lot more complex. It, it allows for a lot of extra things. It allows for multi-dimensionality. So COGS um, can only do one time step at a time, uh, and, they and they can only do one, as I've, as one sort of parameter at a time. So, and that, that, that significantly affects your ability to do chunking, for one thing, and also, um, sort of affects any complex data that you're bringing in. If you're bringing in data which is already multi-dimensional, you're gonna have a hard time. You can put a stack catalog over the top of it to get a little bit of multi-dimensionality going, um, certainly over the time, over time spans. Um, and the newest of the cloud-optimized formats is probably um, cloud-optimized point clouds, which you've also heard about in the previous talk, or COPIC. Um, so that, that's like, like the other formats, that's based on the core format that was already being used before cloud optimized formats came around. It was based on, it's based on LAS and it should basically work as a LAS. And generally what's happening with these cloud optimized formats, although it's early days, is that any library or any software that was supporting the old formats where you downloaded them is sort of being updated to access these cloud optimized formats directly. Um, so what issues have we been facing? And these are issues which, to be honest, I don't have a solution for. Um, updating data, that you have read inconsistency. So these things are sitting on um, block storage. Block storage is not ACID compliant. It's not a database. If you, and, and COGS are an individual file, but the other formats are generally multi-file. There's many, many different files. I call, it, I call it a ZAR file, but it's actually many, many different files. It's like a folder structure. And so when you do an update, different files get updated at different times. That means you have very inconsistent data and your scientists are gonna be accessing that data and it's not gonna be correct. For a period of time while you're updating, it's just not gonna be correct, which is not great. Um, and there's no solution to that until, unless cloud providers were to somehow make their updates um, ACID compliant. Um, there's immaturity of formats, so these are they're, they're, getting, they're getting more mature now. They're, it's two, three years that they've sort of been developing in some cases, um, but they're still, they're still going through standardization processes. There's no way for us to know that if we create a ZAR file or a Geo Parquet file now, right now, it's still gonna be compatible in a year, two years time. So that's pretty scary when you're trying to provide scientists with a, with a consistent format that they can consistently access if we're gonna be um, changing it in the future. Um, and that brings, that, that, go take, that goes to the point of the, the final um, dot point there of the changing structure. 
we're also kind of scared because if we make this, we have to make a lot of decisions about these file formats that aren't in the standards. You know, um, we have to decide. You know, what parameters are we going to to um, share between different data sets? What um, how are we going to chunk those things? And that can make big changes. Uh, and unlike with an API, where if we ha if we were providing a public API to people, we would be versioning those. We wouldn't be just cutting people off and saying, okay, whatever software you built on your old on our old API, we're just going to throw you out now. You know, we would version it. We would say you still have time to do that. Um, so we have to be and and those these startup nice formats do not have that available. Um, I'm also worried that there's too many formats and also formats that for some reason like Parquet should actually be able to support raster data. At the moment, they've the Geo Parquet people have sort of given up on doing a geospatial index, which would make that possible. So I'm quite so so it seems to me that there's a lot of scope for future formats to come around and beat these formats, make them allow raster data and vector data and tabular data, you know, to be in the same format. But I don't think we can be very confident that any of these formats are going to be the overall winner. Um, yeah, so glad to have talked to you about Clay and Navi's Bauer. Questions in the back from Hamish. Danny? Oh, quick, run. Sorry. <laughs> Hurry up. Uh -huh. <laughs> I just want to say, first of all, um, thanks for that. That was really interesting. Um, I was going to give a quick shout out. So, um, uh, GeoPake is great for um, column store database where you have lots of it, lots of you know you're doing analysis over a, uh, an axis. Um, I think we should shout out for a um, flat pack. How was it? Geo flat geo buff. Flat geo buff, which is great for like uh, row level or like record level stuff, which is um, quite relevant to more traditional kind of GIS um, like record keeping and you know where's my manhole and what are its attributes um, type uses because it, it can have that index. Um, I wanted to ask, so um, as I understand it, um, ZAR is a different format from its CDF. Yeah, How, what's the conversion process like? Is that straightforward? Is it's it? Is it? Yeah, it's pretty It's pretty straightforward. If you're going to create a ZAR, you're probably going to be putting lots of NetCDFs into the same ZAR. Um, so that's where things get a little complicated because if they have, if, if there's even slight differences, that, that have been made over time. So we have, you know, data sets that have been over 30 years. The people who are making those data sets have sometimes made changes to compression methods, to parameter types. You know, they've changed from a 32-bit um, integer to some other bit integer, and then, then suddenly they're not compatible. So you have to mess a lot with um, making all of those NetCDFs compatible before you can get to the point of actually merging them into a single ZAR file to get that efficiency of a cloud optimized format. Any other questions from folks? Um, so you had that um, chart showing the, the, I guess, benchmarking the gridded time series use case. And so I can't remember exactly. There were three charts there. It was like, yeah, legacy, bunch of net CDFs, and then you had your Kachunk index, mm. and then you had your direct access to ZAR. Um, so I was wondering, was this benchmarking done kind of on like, I guess, a local machine outside of AWS's super fast network, or was it done? It was done in AWS. So the, the, the ac direct access to ZAR was done on a, a Jupyter notebook that was on their server. Um, and the legacy download solution was done via Batch. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I guess my follow-up is that, you know, depending on how you've chunked the ZAR, when you're doing that kind of pixel drill or whatever you want to call it, it can generate a lot of requests. And so, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to see, like, when you kind of factor in the latency, if, if, the, if the benchmark would change, if you were to kind of do it on a machine, you know, locally or just outside of, yeah, of cloud that's infrastructure. That's, that's absolutely true. And, like, it's, it's one of these things where we're saying with cloud-optimized data, we want to get people as close to the data as possible so they can have that efficiency. But not everyone can be on Amazon. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the alternative is to put it, I suppose, on every one of the cloud providers, but that's, that's not practical. <laughs> Yeah, so it's a, another one of those things where I'd say the cloud providers haven't provided us with a solution yet where they where they would allow us to have that kind of proper, um, you know, interaction between them. Because, yeah, if you if you, I don't I don't see any solution to that. If you if you're gonna have if you're gonna be accessing from a random network somewhere in the world, we can't give you full efficiency. <laughs> Thanks. Is that, is that for example creating the Kachunk index as well, or is it using mm. 
No, it's using a pre made proposal that you've yeah. drawn. Yeah, so it's all, it's all, and I think the, all the in, that the inefficiency there is purely built around how our, our net CDFs are broken into individual um, days, individual time points. Yeah. And so therefore you have no ch you have no real chunking available on a time map at all, which is what you want for time theory. Any other questions? Can you give us another break? <laughs> Um, so I just kind of follow up question. What was the chunking scheme for that ZAR data set? Mm, yeah, so we, we tried to optimize it specifically for time series data there. We went for small geographical extents. Um, I think it was 100 pixels by 100 pixels maybe, and um, probably 100 days worth as well. It's a nice 100 by 100 by 100, I think. <laughs> nice, num nice numbers, yep. <laughs> 